Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I continued to talk to these people, and they gave me information that just blew my mind. One of them said, said when we, whenever we have a couple of drinks, they said we get a slightly tipsy, out-of-control feeling, and we don't like that feeling. Therefore, one or two drinks is all we want to take. Well, today I realize that's the normal reaction. You put alcohol in the system and immediately it races to the brain. It's supposed to give you a slightly tipsy, out of control feeling. And those people don't like that feeling, so one or two drinks is all they want to take. I put it in my system and it races to my brain. I don't get a slightly tipsy, out of control feeling. I get a very exciting, in control feeling. They have two drinks and they want to go to bed. I have two drinks and by God, I want to go to town. I want to get up and do something. I react to it differently, mentally, abnormally. Here's the other thing they told me that amazed me. They said, we take a couple of drinks and put it in our body. And not only do we get the slightly tipsy, out of control feeling, they said, we begin to experience a feeling of nausea. And they said, we don't like that feeling. Therefore, one or two drinks is all we want to take. My God, how many times have you tried to get them to drink more than that? And they'll say, oh, no, no, I feel this already. Oh, no, no, it's making me dizzy. I know it's making me sick. You know, today I realize that's a normal reaction to alcohol. Alcohol is a to- toxic substance. It's a destroyer of human tissue. And when you put something in your body that's going to destroy it, the body is supposed to react with nausea and say, puke it up and get it out of here. When I put it in my body, my body doesn't react with nausea. My body reacts with an actual physical craving that said, put some more in here. Theirs says, puke it out. Mine said, give me some more. And that craving is so strong that it's beyond the ability of my mind to control how much I'm going to drink after I've once started drinking. That's an abnormal reaction to alcohol. So not only do I react to it abnormally physically, but I react to it abnormally mentally as well. You know, we just love to watch normal drinkers. Last several years, I've watched them on airplanes. You got them close. You can see them. You can see what's really going on in there when they drink. And they'll they'll order a drink from the from the flight attendant. Four bucks. Four four dollars for a little old bitty bottle. Hell, not a drink in it to start with. And they they'll order a mixer with it, something like Seven Up or Canada Dry or something. And and, and they go through a stirring ceremony. They they'll pour that alcohol into that mixer and they got a stick and they stir that thing. Damn, I know nothing about stirring a drink. I never could. I never saw it. And you know what they do after they stir and they stir and they stir? You know what they do after they get through stirring? They lay their stick down and they pick up their newspaper and they start reading the paper. And I'm sitting there saying, drink the damn stuff. What the hell have you got it for? Absolutely amazing. That's 30 not- minutes, an hour later, the airplane's about to land. The flight attendant comes by and said, uh, do, you, do you, need, you need to finish your drink? You're about to land. They said, oh, I've got all I want here. You can have it. And have to give half of it back. That's alcohol abuse, isn't it? That's alcohol abuse, if I ever heard of it. That's for sure. <laughs> you watch them. You know, Charlie started out with this allergy in his first drink, but I didn't. I developed mine slowly over a period of time through the use and abuse of alcohol, but we arrived at the same place. It don't make any difference how we got there. We arrived at the same place. And he told us about this allergy to alcohol. said it explains many things which we cannot otherwise account. It explained to me, for instance, why I would go down by the bar with every intention of having a couple of drinks and going home. I meant to do that. But the next thing I know, because of the allergy, and of course I'm not aware of it, the next thing I know is midnight or 1 or 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning I haven't got home yet. That explains to me why I didn't do that. Because once I take a drink, I crave more and more and more, and I'm going to have it. In the end, I'd be gone sometimes for a week before I get home. 
That's what alcohol did for me. So he told us about the algae over there, and again, he's going to talk a little bit more about it on Roman numeral page uh, 26 or 28. A good textbook never tells you anything but what it doesn't back it up with more information. We read about the allergy over here. Now let's go over to, in the third edition, Roman numeral 26, and let's see a little more information on this allergy. Uh, Roman numeral page 28 in the fourth edition. So we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. I was diagnosed one time as a chronic alcoholic. I don't like that then. I don't particularly like it now. But I do understand today what it means. Chronic simply means doing the same things over and over and over again. So I'm a chronic alcoholic. And that is a, is a manifestation of an allergy. And that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. He called it a phenomenon of craving. He didn't quite understand what that meant at that time. We didn't know as much about metabolism as we do today, and he certainly didn't either. So he called it a phenomenon of craving. It happens after we take a drink. He says these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence or reliance upon things human, the problems pile upon them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Okay, the manifestation of an allergy to strawberries is a rash. The manifestation of an allergy to milk is dysentery. The manifestation of an allergy to ragweeds is itchy, watery eyes and sneezing. The manifestation of the allergy to alcohol is referred to here as the phenomenon of craving. It's an actual physical craving that occurs in the body after we've had a couple of drinks. And it never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Now, people used to, my wife used to say to me, why didn't you come home after you had a couple of drinks? And I never could explain that to her. Never could, I can't explain it to her today. But it's an actual physical craving that occurs in my body that doesn't occur in the average temperate drinker. They'll never understand it. We alcoholics are the only people that can understand it. We're the only people that know it. We're the only people that experience it. Now, if we could take a drink without getting drunk, if we could take a drink without producing the phenomenon of craving, well, hell, we'd all be out there somewhere drinking without producing the phenomenon of craving. But we can't. Therefore, we are considered to be alcoholics, this hopeless condition of the mind and of the body. Now think about this a little bit. The word craving in the big book, it's very important. A lot of people use the word craving to say, well, I craved a drink for three years after I came to AA. No, that's the wrong use of the word craving in the context of the big book. In the context of the big book, the word craving occurs only in the body. I needed a drink. I wanted a drink. I desired a drink for a while after I came in AA. But the only way we alcoholics can crave alcohol is first put it in our body. Then the phenomenon of craving develops, and then we end up drunk and sick and in all kinds of trouble. So in this first 164 pages of the big book, when you see the word craving, it's always referring to the body, never to the mind. We use a different word for the mind later on. Now, over on page... Uh, Roman numeral 28, page 30 in the fourth edition. He's going to carry this just a little bit further. He's going to talk about five different kinds of alcoholics. And then he's going to drive this idea of the phenomenon of craving home one more time. Let's look at these five different alcoholics. I'm sure there's a lot more different types of alcoholics than these five. I, matter of fact, I believe there's many different types of alcoholics as our people in this room here this afternoon. But he's going to talk about five. He said the classification of alcoholics seems the most difficult, and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths or emotionally unstable, so we're all familiar with this type. 
They're always going on the wagons for keeps. They are over remorseful to make many resolutions but never a decision. We call that type one. There is a type of man who's unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. Type two. There is a type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. Type three. There is a mag depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends about whom a whole chapter could be written. Type four. And I always thought I was the next one, type five. <laughs> if you have to identify one of them, I think this next one would be, would be the one. Then there are types entirely normal in every respect, except in effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. <laughs> I used to read that, and I'd think, well, how in the hell did he know so much about me? I wrote this book. He said, all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been by any treatment which we are familiar permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. Now, I think this is what he said. If all we alcoholics in this room this afternoon should take a drink... God forbid that happen. But if we did, we would not all react just exactly the same. In just a little bit, one of us would be up on one of these tables hooping and hollering and dancing and cutting up and having a good time. In just a little bit, one of us would be crying in our beer, oh, boo-hoo, the world not treating me right. In just a little bit, there'll be a couple over here and getting in a fight just sure as anything. In a little bit, you look in the back of the room, there's a couple back there, one's putting a bake on the other. We tend to do that also when we drink. We would do many different things. But if we're a real alcoholic, there's one thing every one of us would do. We would start looking for a second drink. The phenomenon of craving is developed. We can't stop, and we've got to have a third drink, and a fourth drink, and a fifth drink, and a sixth drink, and on and on until we're drunk and we're sick and we're in all kinds of trouble. Now, it really doesn't make any difference whether we're born with that or whether we drank ourselves into that. The fact remains that's the way we are today. If we were not that way today, we wouldn't be sitting in this room. If you and I could drink without getting drunk, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be out there somewhere drinking without getting drunk. But you see, we can't do this because of this physical allergy to alcohol. Also, it doesn't make any difference how long it takes us to get drunk either. Now, some of you might have one or two drinks today, and then you may have three or four tomorrow, and you may have five or six the next day. This thing has advanced to the point in me, if I would take a drink right now at about ten minutes till five, by eight or nine o'clock I found a policeman and I'm somewhere in jail. And there's no way that I can control the amount I drink after I want to start. But what difference does it make? Now, it may take you a week to find your cop and get in jail. It only takes me a matter of a few hours. But the end result is the same in both cases because of the physical allergy and alcohol. Now, that, we believe, is why we need to talk about alcohol and alcohol only within an AA meeting. Because, you see, that's the only thing we have in common. Everybody in this room is different from everybody else, you know, except for one thing. The thing we have in common is alcoholism, and on that we can come together and join together and identify with each other and try to find a method of recovery from alcoholism. That's why AA has singleness of purpose. That's the second time I've preached. I won't preach anymore, <laughs> Joe. I'll do that. Let's go out. Okay, we're going to look at a little picture. Now, let us be the first to say that this picture is not AA information. AA doesn't talk about why we're allergic to alcohol, because that would be a way to create some controversy. AA just says we're allergic to it. But this information was presented some years ago. And it has such depth and such meaning, I think we would be remiss if we didn't look at it for just a few minutes. 
to maybe be able to understand this physical allergy, this phenomenon of craving. Now, we've looked at study after study after study after study after study regarding we alcoholics, and they all point to the same identical thing. Maybe they use a little bit different wording, but in one form or the other, they all point to the fact that we are abnormal. We metabolize alcohol differently than normal people do. In 1930s, they didn't know much about alcoholism. They didn't know much about metabolism. Today they do. Today the medical profession knows that if you take anything and put it in your system, such as a piece of beefsteak, the mind and body will recognize what it is. Certain organs of the body will produce some things called enzymes. The enzymes attack that piece of beefsteak. And they break it down and separate it into usable and non-usable items. And the body will retain what it needs. It'll retain the amino acids, the vitamins, the proteins. The things it can't use, it will dissipate through the urinary and intestinal tract. The body will do that with anything you put in it, as long as it's not a deadly poison that will kill you before it can be metabolized, or unless it's some kind of solid, such as a piece of glass or a piece of marble that it can't metabolize. But anything in the food and the liquid category the body can metabolize it. This little picture shows in the center the nine people who drink safely. The normal, social, temperate, moderate drinker. Those who are at ease with alcohol. Those that don't get drunk and sick and in all kinds of trouble. They put alcohol in the system. The mind and body recognize what it is. The enzyme, enzyme production starts. The enzymes attack the alcohol and break it down to a material called acetaldehyde. After a while, it's broken down to diacetic acid. Then it's broken down to acetone. And in the final stages, it becomes a simple carbohydrate made up of water, sugar, and carbon dioxide. The water will be dissipated through the urinary and intestinal tract. The sugar is a form of energy, calories, empty calories, none of the amino acids, none of the vitamins, none of the things necessary for life, but a form of energy. The body will burn it as such, store the excess as fat to be used at a later date. The carbon dioxide will be dissipated through the lungs. In the normal social temperate moderate drinker, this metabolic rate is approximately one ounce per hour. Now, I know it will vary with different people, but the average is one ounce per hour. And if they don't drink more than an ounce per hour, they're not going to get drunk because their body can metabolize it, consume it, burn it up, and get rid of it at that rate. Very seldom do you see a social drinker drinking more than one ounce per hour. If you're around them and they're doing that, you better stand back because they're probably going to puke on you after a while. It's not going to stay in there very long. Let's look over on the left-hand side of the chart. This is the one who does not drink safely or is at dis-ease with alcohol. And by the way, that's, all, that's the only thing the word disease means anyhow, something that separates you from the norm. We alcoholics put alcohol in our system, the same thing happens. The enzyme production starts. It breaks it down to acetaldehyde, then to diacetic acid, then to acetone. And that seems as though in the body of the alcoholic, the enzymes necessary to metabolize it from acetone to the simple carbohydrate are not there in the same qualities and or quantities as they are in the body of the non-alcoholic. Therefore, it stays in our body for a longer period of time as acetone. It's a proven fact today that acetone ingested into the human system that remains there for an appreciable period of time will create an actual physical craving which demands more of the same. 
The physical craving demands a second drink. And then that demands a third drink. And then that demands a fourth drink. And we're off on the well-known stages of a spree. Now, if it never got any worse, you and I could probably learn to live with that situation. We probably could have kept on drinking. We also, not only do we have an illness known as alcoholism, we have a progressive illness known as alcoholism that always gets worse and never better. Probably for two reasons. Number one, we know that acetone is a destroyer of human tissue. We know that the more we drink, the longer we drink, the more alcohol we put in our system, the more the acetone destroys human tissue. And it seems as though the first organs of the body that it really begins to destroy are the liver and the pancreas. Today they know the liver and the pancreas are the organs of the body that produce the enzymes necessary to metabolize alcohol. And as they are damaged, the enzyme production becomes less and less and less. The craving becomes harder and harder and harder. The drinking becomes harder and harder and harder. And the result in trouble becomes worse and worse and worse. Probably also due to the aging factor. We know that as the body gets older, it begins to shut down on the production of everything. Now, I wish that were not true, but believe me, it is. I'm experiencing quite a bit of that. If I would take a drink today, I wouldn't start where I left off X number of years ago. If I would take a drink today, the phenomenon of craving would be much, much worse. The drinking would be much worse. The result in trouble would be much, much worse. So I'm in the grip of a progressive illness. Whether I drink or whether I don't drink, it's still going to get worse and worse as time goes by. And as I look at this picture now, I begin to understand why I never have been able to drink like other people. You know, we take a drink of alcohol, we put it in the system, and in a short period of time it produces the phenomenon of craving because of that acetone. Okay, that requires a second drink. The second drink, I've still got most of the acetone from the first drink in my body. Now I put that in from the second drink. Well, what happens? The craving becomes harder, and that demands a third drink. I take the third, I've got most of the second, most of the first, the acetone level goes up, the crumb lay out, run over me a leg, and they come running up to me and say, can we help you? And I say, my God, yes, give me another drink. <laughs> See, we're craving it harder after 20 drinks than we were after two drinks. That's why I never could get enough. I drank alcohol 26 years. I don't ever remember drinking all the alcohol that I wanted. My God, I drank, I drank more than I needed a million times, but I never got all I wanted. I'm laying there sick and puking my guts up and wanting another drink at the same time. That explains to me why I can no longer safely drink. Now, if that was my only problem, if that was your only problem, well, hell, we'd just pass the hat and collect the dollar and we'd all go home. And we'd never have to worry about alcoholism again. But you see, this is just half of my problem, the physical allergy. I have a friend who is allergic to, of all things, fish. And every time he eats fish, his throat swells up and he almost chokes to death. Now, the fact that he's allergic to fish is really beside the point. Because if he never ate those fish, then his throat wouldn't swell up, and he wouldn't almost choke to death, and he wouldn't have in the hospital. But he's got another problem in addition to being allergic to fish. There's something in his mind that's not right when it comes to fish. There's a switch that doesn't close, a light bulb that doesn't come on, or something. Because from time to time, his mind tells him it's okay to eat fish. And he'll eat the fish, the allergy takes over, and he ends up in a hospital every time. And I'll bet you it always starts like this. Well, I haven't had any fish in 90 days. Surely I could have one piece of fish. It's that damn rock cod I've been eating. If I'd eaten nothing but halibut, I'd be okay. <laughs> so it might even say it's them damn people I've been eating fish with. If I'd just change my crowd, everything would be all right. Whatever it is, his mind gives him permission. 
I'm the same way when it comes to alcohol. And left on my own resources, my mind always tells me it's okay to take a drink. I believe some kind of lie. I think this time it's going to be different. I think, my God, anybody who's been sober six months owes themselves a couple of beers. One of my favorites used to be, I'm going to the liquor store and I'm just going to buy half a pint and nobody can get drunk on a half a pint. And my mind would give me permission to drink. Then the allergy took over and then I ended up drunk and sick every time. A hopeless condition of mind and body. Silky knew us quite well. Not only does he tell us about the allergy, he tells us about the mind too, Joe. Yeah. The main reason I quit drinking was because I couldn't quit drinking. The doctor tells us here that if we have this allergy to alcohol, we crave more after we drink, and we drink more than we intended to. He said the only thing we have suggested is entire absence. In other words, don't drink. Because if you don't drink, the physical craving can't happen. So now we're going to talk about the second part of alcoholism, the most dangerous part of the illness. It's not when we're drinking. It's when we're sober. And the most reason, the, the, the reason it's the most dangerous part of the illness is because we're thinking about drinking. So now let's move back to uh, Roman numeral page 28 in the 4th edition and 26 in the 3rd edition, if we will, at the bottom of the page. It says that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And many alcoholics are highly offended when you say that. They say, oh, no, 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 that's not the reason I drank. They say the reason I drank is I love the taste of alcohol. I wouldn't argue with them whether they do or not. You know, I love the taste of cold beer. I always have all my life. I also love the taste of cold mountain spring water. I never did sit down and drink a case of cold mountain spring water. <laughs> cold beer did something for me that cold mountain spring water didn't do. You know, as a kid growing up, I was always on the outside of the crowd looking in. Always wanted to be a part of. Always knew that it could not be. Always knew that whatever I said, whatever I did would be the wrong thing. You would laugh and I would be embarrassed by it. You ladies, I couldn't even get close to you. If I got within 10 feet of you, I was absolutely, completely terrified and tongue-tied. And one night, 14 years old, at a high school dance, a guy drank, gave me a drink of moonshine whiskey. And all those feelings disappeared. My God, I was allowed to do things I'd never been able to do before. I was allowed to ask a girl to dance with her. I was allowed to dance with her. I was allowed to take her home from the dance. I was allowed to get in the back seat of a 36 Chevrolet and do some things that I'd been wanting to do for a long, long time. I loved what alcohol did for me. Now, if it gave me a slightly tipsy, out-of-control, nauseous feeling, I wouldn't love that. But you see, always for me, it has given me that great, exciting in control feeling and allowed me to do things that I could not do sober that I could go ahead and do them drunk I loved what it did for me that's why men and women drink because we like the effect it produces if it made us slightly tipsy out of control and sick we wouldn't like that but you see it reacts differently in we alcoholics we react differently to it not only physically but also mentally I remember the first time I had a drink at a, at a high school a junior high school dance I'm like Charlie. I, was, I normally sat there and hold up that wall, you know. Finally, I took a drink of this white light that my cousin had. I walked right over to that gal. And I said, would you like to dance? And she said, sure, Joe, I'd love to. I didn't know you could dance. I said, I didn't either. <laughs> Alcohol did something for me, you see. And there are many, many effects. And Charlie described them. We described some of them. But there are many, many effects by which we drink. Sometimes we... Uh, want to do some of those things that we wouldn't, wouldn't do otherwise. We have a few drinks, then we do them. The next morning, I wake up with a little bit of guilt, shame, and remorse as a result of some of the things I did the night before. I take another little drink, and it would take, change the way that I felt, thought, and felt about those things. And we know that alcoholism is a progressive illness. It gets worse over a period of time. And for me, in the end of my drinking, I was drinking for the most sickest effect of all was total oblivion. You all know who drank for oblivion. There's only one thing wrong with that, isn't there? You wake up. you got to start all over again. So there are many, many effects by which we drink. He says the sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, 
They cannot after time differentiate the true from the false. I got to why I didn't know the true from the false about alcoholism. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. My, my abnormal drinking became normal to me. It became normal. The abnormal became normal. I told my wife one morning, we had been out drinking, and by the way, she'd been sober in AA for 26 years now, thank God. And I uh, said, Phyllis, do you realize that most people don't drink like we do? You know what she said to me? She said bullshit. I don't talk that way. That's what she said. <laughs> she said, everybody we know drinks just like we do. And I got to thinking, well, yeah, that's true. Everybody that I ran around with drank somewhat like we did, and we didn't run around together. And every bar that I went to, they and everybody in that bar drank somewhat like I did, or I didn't go to those bars. That's why I kept working my way down to those sleazy places where I ended up. The misty dawn. I almost smell it now. Their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. The abnormal became normal. That's one thing we got to remember when we're working with new people. They really cannot differentiate the truth from the false. What they've been doing while they're drinking has become the normal thing to do. We try to, somebody tries to talk to a guy that's out there drinking and says, can't you see what it's doing to you? No, he can't see that, he or she. It's absolutely normal. You know, hell, the first time you get in jail, that's abnormal. But if you get in jail 10 or 15 times, it becomes normal. First divorce is abnormal, but after three or four, it's normal. Mm -hmm. First car wreck is abnormal, but after five or six, it's normal. And they really cannot differentiate the truth from the false. We really cannot see what alcohol is doing to us while we're out there drinking. That's why Dr. Bob always recommended hospitalization at least long enough to detox and get the alcohol out of the system so the mind can begin to function and maybe see the truth about things. The book goes on to say, this is what we are when we're not drinking. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. Put a few more little words in there, too. We're full of guilt, shame, and remorse. Remember when you were brand new, they said, if you don't drink, you're going to feel better? Well, you're going to feel re anger better. You're going to feel resentment better. You're going to feel a lot of things better. Because we don't have the alcohol to kill the pain. We're restless, irritable, and discontented, full of guilt, shame, and remorse, and anger, and resentment, and all those <laughs> negative emotions. And that's what we are. We're running around with stark, raving, sober. And that's why we have to work on those steps pretty quick. So unless they can again experience the sense and ease of comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Impunity means, like my neighbor, he could drink, and, and seemingly he didn't get in any trouble. I wanted to drink like him, but he wasn't an alcoholic because I don't know that. So I wanted to drink with impunity without getting into trouble. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, then they take the drink, the phenomenal craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. Now, this is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over. How many times have I promised myself, my wife, my daughter, anybody who will listen, I'll never take another drink. I promise you. And those of you who made those same promises, you know that I meant that. I really did. But you see, I didn't know I had a, uh, an illness called alcoholism either. I was unaware of that. So it was repeated over and over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little, little hope for his recovery. An entire change of mind, talk about the psychic, Silkwood called it, an entire change of mind while not drinking, there's very little, little hope for his recovery. Bill calls it a personality change, a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. Changes, a psychic change. Uh, there's very little hope for our recovery. Okay, over here on this uh, picture we got here on your right, this kind of is going to indicate the, the mental problem that we have. We drew a little picture here and we call that an emotional barometer and all human beings have emotions you know there's times we're angry and there's times we're highly elated 
There's times we're sad, and there's times we're afraid, and all human beings have emotional problems, some of us worse than others. I know when I was a kid growing up, I was an emotional basket case. I never did fit anywhere I went. I was short. I was a little bit chubby. I always wore these glasses. And that leads to emotional problems if you're a young boy. Everywhere I went, I was constantly afraid, constantly worried about what people thought of me, constantly worried about what they were going to do to me, constantly worried about whether I would measure up, constantly worried about something. Now, I don't think that's an exception. All kids have that, some of us worse than others. And the night this guy gave me this drink of moonshine whiskey, that immediately went to my brain. And immediately, all those emotional problems disappeared. I wasn't afraid any longer. I wasn't worried about what people thought any longer. I knew that whatever I said, whatever I did, would be just great, and I knew that everybody was going to like me as sure as anything. And I knew that if I asked that girl to dance with me, she was going to say, okay. And I knew if she said, okay, I'd be able to dance with her. And I knew if I asked her to take her home from the dance, she'd say, all right. And I knew everything would be okay in the back seat of that 36 Chevrolet. Alcohol did for me what I could not do for myself. It answered my emotional problem immediately. Now, the human mind is a funny thing. When you've got a problem, and I don't care what the problem is, if you find a solution to it, your mind is going to record that solution. And, of course, the purpose of that is the next time we have the problem, we don't have to go look for a solution. The mind will play that back to us. And the next time I got into one of those situations where I wasn't feeling right, and there was alcohol available, my mind fed back to me that great sense of ease and comfort that that drink of moonshine whiskey gave to me. My mind fed back to me that great exciting in control feeling that that alcohol did for me. My mind fed back to me all the fun that I had whenever I took that drink of moonshine whiskey. Now, my mind didn't play back to me, though, the fact that I got drunk that night. It didn't play, it didn't play back to me the fact that I, had a, that I blacked out. It didn't play back to me the fact that I ended up home in bed the next morning and didn't even know how I got there. It remembered only the good thing that alcohol did for me. Alcohol immediately became the solution to my problem. Now, if I was an alcoholic, that would have been okay. But you see, as an alcoholic, I run around an emotional basket case, and I'm not feeling good, and I'm restless, and I'm irritable, and I'm discontented, and I'm filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse associated with the things I've been doing when I got drunk, and I want to feel better. And my mind begins to think about that great sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. It doesn't remember the jailhouse. It doesn't remember the divorce court. It doesn't remember the car wreck. I've never seen an alcoholic yet say, I'm going to go have two drinks and have a car wreck tonight. No, it's always I'm going to have a couple of drinks and have fun. Remembering what alcohol does for us, not what it does to us. And I'd reach over and take a couple of drinks, and sure enough, the magic would happen again. And then I'd just fit in. I could be anything you wanted me to be when I was drinking. Anything you wanted me to be, I could be. But as an alcoholic, it would come over here, and it would trigger the allergy, and I would continue drinking until I got drunk and got sick and got in all kinds of trouble. Now, like most alcoholics, when I first started drinking, I had, a, I had a tremendous capacity for alcohol. I could drink more than anybody else in the crowd drank, and I was the one that took them home from the dance. 
And I was proud of that fact. A real man standing on his own two feet, show the rest of them, by God, I can drink like John Wayne drinks. But as time went by, my emotional problems, I'd take a drink and I'd trigger the allergy. And as time went by, the drinking got worse and worse and worse. And now many of the things that I was afraid going to happen when I'm sober begin to happen to me when I was drunk. I begin to get too drunk. I begin to make an ass of myself on the dance floor. I begin to be the one that pukes at the dining room table. I began to be the one that didn't look very good at all. And I'd come off of one of those drunks and I'd say, you know, I've been drinking too much. I, I believe what I better do is uh, cut down on my drinking. No, I didn't think about quitting drinking. I said, I believe I better cut down on my drinking. I better start controlling the amount that I drink so I don't get too drunk. Did any of you guys ever try to control the amount you drink while drinking? Uh -huh. Now I know why I couldn't do that. The more I tried to control my drinking while drinking, the drunker I got and the more trouble I got into. But I'd get sober and, 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 and I didn't want to get I didn't want to get drunk. I didn't want to get in jail. I didn't want to get in a divorce court. I'd come off of that drunk and I'd be sober. I just wanted to feel better. I just wanted to feel better. And I'd start thinking about taking a drink. And after a while, the drink became again the solution to that condition. I forgot I, I forgot I got in jail last week. You know, hell, I forgot that she took me through a divorce court two or three months ago. I forgot about this and that and that. And I just think about the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. And sure enough, it would happen. Man, I'd take a couple of drinks and I'd be on top of the world for 15 or 20 or 30 minutes. And any allergy would take over and I'd end up drunk. And finally one day I said to myself, well, Charlie, you know, I'm a slow learner. I said, Charlie, you know, I don't, I, I don't believe you can drink anymore. I think what you better do is just quit drinking. Now, when we alcoholics quit drinking, we trot out our most useful tool, and it's called willpower. And we stick it in here between our emotional problems and the solution. And we say, sick him, Will. I ain't never going to take another drink as long as I live. And I really meant that. Now, people that don't understand us, they try to tell us that we are weak-willed people. Don't you believe that? We're strong-willed people. Weak-willed people do not become alcoholic. Third time they puke, they quit drinking. The alcoholic knows there's got to be some way to drink without getting drunk and puking and getting sick and getting in trouble. And we use our willpower and we damn near kill ourselves with it. I stuck old willpower in there and I said, I'm through with that damn drinking. Told my wife I'm through with that drinking. Told my kids I'm through with that drinking. You'll never have to worry about me anymore. And I was sitting down here on the bottom of this chart and I was restless and I was irritable. And I was discontented, and I remembered the things that I'd done, those last drunks that were so terrible, and I was filled with shame and guilt and scared to death what people do when they find out. And I'm running around sober okay, but I'm not feeling very good. And my emotions begin to build up and build up and build up and build up, and one day it triggered the idea of taking a drink, and I said, oh, no, 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 I'm through with that drinking. I'm not going to drink anymore. Willpower kept me from drinking at that emotional level. But as the days went by, the emotions got worse. I got more restless and more irritable and more discontented. Couldn't get along with my wife, couldn't get along on the job, couldn't get along with my bird dogs, couldn't get along with my kids, couldn't get along with nothing. And the emotions built up and built up, and one day it said, let's have a drink. And the idea of taking a drink burned through willpower, and I took the drink, and I triggered the allergy, and I ended up drunk and sick and in all kinds of trouble, and I emerged from that with a firm resolution not to drink again. And I repeated that cycle over and over and over and over and over again, just exactly like Dr. Silkworth talks. Unless I do something about my emotional makeup, 
unless I do something to change this area in here, then my mind is going to again start remembering a sense of ease and comfort. The great, exciting, in control feeling I get from a drink. And next thing you know, willpower is gone. You see, the only time that willpower works is when the mind sees something wrong with what it's wanting to do. And just before you and I take a drink, our mind doesn't see anything wrong with taking a drink. And willpower is no longer existent. And we end up taking the drink, we trigger the allergy, and we get drunk over and over and over and over again. Now, we can't do anything about the body. Nothing can be done about this allergy. So if I'm going to recover, it has to be somewhere here in the mind. And the only way it seems as though I can recover is to find a way to live where rather than be restless, irritable, and discontented, rather than be filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse, I can be sober and peaceful and happy and free and contented. And you see, if I could find a way to live down here where I would be peaceful and happy and free and contented, then my emotions are not going to start building up. And if they do, they will not build up to the level that makes me think it's okay to take a drink. And that's recovery from alcoholism. Dr. Silkworth refers to that as a psychic change. Our psychic is made up by ideas, attitudes, and emotions. They determine whether we're going to be happy, whether we're going to be peaceful, whether we're going to be free, or whether we're going to be restless, irritable, and discontented. And that's the whole purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The last ten steps, if I apply them in my life, I'm guaranteed in the twelfth step that I will have a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. And the big book defines a spiritual awakening as a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. Dr. Jung told Roland Hazard, it's when ideas, emotions, and attitudes which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side and replaced with a new set of ideas, emotions, and attitudes. I don't think the way I used to think when I came to AA. I don't feel the way I used to feel when I came to AA. I've employed this program in my life, and I've had a spiritual awakening, a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. Now, let me get away from AA. Let me get away from the program. Let me quit using the steps as they're designed to be used. And the next thing you know, I'm irritable and discontented. Next thing you know, I start doing things I shouldn't be doing. I become filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. Next thing you know, I'm sober and I don't feel good. And when an alky sober and don't feel good, that's a dangerous situation. How many of us have seen them leave us after five years and ten and fifteen and twenty and even thirty years sobriety simply by getting away from our program of action? But if I can get that program of action and employ it in my life and have a spiritual awakening, I'm still going to have some emotional problems. And everybody's going to have some emotional problems, but they don't build up beyond that level. And if they don't build up beyond that level, then I don't need willpower in order to try to keep me sober. That's called recovery from alcoholism. That's what our whole program is about. Joe, you want to read that next paragraph? The next paragraph, paragraph says, On the other hand, as strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. And, of course, we know the few simple rules are the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what we've learned from this is the obsession of the mind is stronger than our willpower. Anytime there's a battle going on between the obsession of the mind and our willpower, the obsession will win out every single time because it's stronger than our will.
Okay, it's quite easy to see there by looking at this chart what our problem really is. We can't drink because of the body, because of the allergy. We can't stay sober because of the obsession of the mind. And if you can't drink because of the body, you can't stay sober because of the obsession of the mind, then we've become absolutely, become absolutely powerless over alcohol. That's the greatest information I've ever seen. Greatest information I've ever known. Today I'm so glad that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Today I'm so glad that I'm one of the alcoholics that really know what my problem is. Today I'm so glad that we have a program that will help us overcome that problem where we don't have to stay powerless over alcohol. That's why the first 100 says precisely how we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. That's all we got for this afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Joe, you got anything? <laughs> we'll see you back here at 7.30 tonight, okay? My name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. I don't look like it, but I'm an alcoholic. And it's truly by God's grace and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I find in a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sober today, and for that I'm very, very thankful. And I'm excited to be here also. I uh, heard a story here a while back about a drunk driver up and down the expressway out here, and the highway patrol pulled him over, and he walked up and said, Sir, I'm going to have to give you a ticket for speeding. And he said, Now, I was not speeding. I had the cruise control set right on the speed limit. So I was not speeding. And his wife said, no, that's not true. I told you way back there to slow down or you're going to get a ticket. He said, you shut up. I'll deal with you and I'll get you home. The highway patrol said, yes, I'm going to have to give you a ticket also for not having your seat belt on. He said, now, I had my seat belt on, and I knew that you'd be wanting to see my driver's license, so I took it off so I could get to it. And his wife said, no, that's not true. I told you way back there to put your seat belt on and slow down. You're going to get a ticket. He said, you shut up. I'll deal with you, and I'll get you home. The highway patrol said, ma'am, does he always talk to you like this? And she said, only when he's drinking. <laughs> sound about right. Yeah, sound about right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we, uh, <clears throat> we spent a lot on Charlie Parmian. I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi, Charlie. Uh, we spent a lot of time this afternoon in our first session talking about uh, some of the history of the big book and the forewords and the preface and et cetera. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the doctor's opinion and the physical allergy and the obsession of the mind and those things that go together to make us absolutely powerless over alcohol. And tonight we're going to start looking into Bill's story. And we think that Bill's story fits in the big book just exactly where it should be. Remember that uh, Dr. Silkworth gave Bill the problem, told him about the physical allergy, told him about the obsession of the mind, those things that made him absolutely powerless over alcohol. And that was great news for Bill. As he thought his problem was willpower, he thought it was moral character, he thought it was sin. And it was great for him to find out what his problem really was. We also know that when Bill went to visit with Dr. Bob, just prior to going to see Dr. Bob, he talked to Dr. Silkworth. And he said, Doctor, I've been having a lot of problem in trying to work with these other alcoholics here in New York City. I take them to meetings. I do everything I can to, to get them to get sober. And none of them seem to be interested in what I have to offer. And Dr. Silkworth said, well, Bill, what you really need to do is explain to them the exact nature of the illness. Tell them what I told you. And he said, if you do that, you'll get their interest. And then after you get the interest, then you can talk to them about spirituality and et cetera. But tell them what's wrong with them first. Not by accident that when Bill, the very next person he talked to, happened to be Dr. Bob in Akron. And as we said before, when he went to visit with Dr. Bob at the gatehouse, Henrietta Cyberling's home, they sat down together, and Bill didn't talk to Dr. Bob about Dr. Bob's drinking. He talked to Dr. Bob about his own drinking. In other words, he shared his story with Dr. Bob. 
And a part of the story that he shared with Dr. Bob was what he had learned from Dr. Silkworth. And he shared the physical allergy of the body. He shared the obsession of the mind. And Dr. Bob immediately identified with that. And after that, then Dr. Bob was able to apply the program to a depth necessary to recover from alcoholism. Never had been able to do that before. So it's not by accident that the next thing in the big book after the doctor's opinion is Bill's story. we got to remember that back in 1939, 37, 38, 39, they were all members of the Oxford group until the time that the book was printed in 1939. And the Oxford groups had a thing that they called a visit. So these guys would go out and visit with a new alcoholic. And as they visited with a new alcoholic, they would share their stories and etc. and help the newcomer see what their problem really is. Now, when they got ready to write the big book, though, they knew that the first person out here in California, they wouldn't be able to come out here and do a one-on-one -on -one visit and share their story. The first person down in Texas, the first one in Florida, and etc. So the big book had to be complete enough to do the job not only of telling us what the problem is in the doctor's opinion, but in sharing our story with another alcoholic. And Bill's story in the big book does just exactly that. As we go through it this evening, a lot of people say, well, we can't identify with Bill because, after all, he was a New York City stockbroker or stock speculator, and we were not. Uh, a lot of people say, a lot of the women say we couldn't identify with Bill because he's a man, and, and of course we were not. Uh, down in my part of the country, we say, yeah, and he was a Yankee. That was another problem we had. But if we look at Bill's story... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.